Hello tubers, this is Kurt with Edibles and Exotics coming to you from sunny Tucson. We're at the Tucson Swales, uh, George and I. Uh, he did the video with me at his house for the permaculture, how to start a permaculture food forest in your backyard. We drove out here uh, from Mesa, it was about a two hour drive. And we're down here, we hiked in, it's not far from the road. Um, you know, everyone always says it's a long hike. It literally took us maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes of walking yeah. to get here. We're at the main swale. Um, many greats in the permaculture industry like Jeff Lawton and uh, Bill Mollison have been out here and have done video. So we thought it'd be great to come out here and show what permaculture is like in the desert. So George here is going to tell you exactly uh, the history on these swales. And then we're going to take you around and we're going to do some test holes, show you uh, the moisture level. We're going to shoot some ground shots with the infrared thermometer and then we're just going to show you around so take it away george let's hear some history well from what little i could find on it I, these were done in 1937 as part of the civilian conservation corps is that yep the yeah, correct it was name a, for it? a work release program from what i understand for prisoners like a voluntary work leave release so they weren't stuck in prison sweating to death in the summer because there was no oh. ac or anything back then and they were so, out here sweating to death yeah sweating to death and uh so it was how was it built i mean obviously it's, they didn't have tractors and stuff no, back they, then, they right? came out here built it by hand so I shovels mean, horses so, yeah hey, all by hand um I mean, you look at it nowadays and most people would think this can't be done, but uh, I've seen a lot done with just human ingenuity. So, so how, yeah. how long, when you, in your research, how long do you think it took them from start to finish? Not so much the planning, but actual, the, the physical labor to get these guys mounded up and constructed. Uh, I, 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 I had didn't I couldn't find any information on that on how long they took, but I would imagine this took, from what we've seen, anywhere from two to five years. Okay, and uh, this one probably being the most difficult. Yeah, so we're in the main swale. Yeah. So the main swale is a horseshoe, correct? Yes. So the swale itself is horseshoe shaped, and then all the other smaller swales, they're just like, <laughs> they're just. Uh, so the other swales, they're just, uh, they're not horseshoe shaped. They're more of just a, a straight mound. Yeah, like just a, a straight, yeah, straight line. Okay. And uh, we're going to walk up these swales a little bit, and we'll show you how they actually feed in uh, water, runoff water from the mountains behind us. So uh, how long soon after uh, the swales were built that they were just basically abandoned? Because they never used these for what they were intended to be used for, correct? Yeah. I mean... So maybe a year or so, probably they, they just never did anything with them. They built them and, and that was a, a Roosevelt project. Yes. Correct. And that was uh, shortly after the Dust Bowl, they were trying to, to get America back to work. Yeah. Trying to, to experiment and figure out how to trap moisture and sink it into the ground, just permaculture style. Right. Yeah. Well, before permaculture was invented, um, I think nowadays we know a little bit more about what could be done out here that would make these more successful and as we take you around in here we'll actually show you that these aren't as successful as they've been purported to be yeah so this is both of our first times out here and uh, we made the trip down just to shoot the video and uh, you know we were under the impression that this was going to be uh, an oasis in the desert and it somewhat is but it's an oasis more or less for desert hardy trees and shrubs and grasses. And uh, we're gonna take you around. And, and like I said, we're gonna do the test holes and the shooting it with an infrared. And uh, maybe in the rainy season, this, this is uh, a very productive area, but you know, we're just coming right out of the rainy season right now. And we're uh, middle of uh, April. And you know, our rainy season ended about like, probably about a month ago. So, there really isn't uh, much growth, much vegetative growth around here. And uh, as you can see behind us, you know, the, the grass, it's, it's starting to really dry up. You know, they, yeah. 
we see uh, walking around, we, we do see a lot of cow poop around here. So there are cows in here at from time to time, but uh, we haven't seen anything here. I mean, you know, we've heard a couple of birds and that's about it. Seen some lizards maybe, but other than that, no wildlife, uh, no snakes or anything like that. Coming in guys, we, uh, we had a walk probably, uh, I would say maybe 400 yards or so, sound about right until we heard, hit the first swale. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so yeah, it, it wasn't very far from the road, guys. Um, so I think we went through maybe like four or five swales until we hit the main swale. So it's, it's really not very far. Um, most of the swales when you're walking up, the mounds are, I would say, maybe 15 feet tall or so, for my no. estimation. Actually, probably maybe 10. 10. For the smaller ones. For the smaller ones. And okay. then when we got to this, we knew this was the main one because it's probably 18 to 20 feet tall at the the tallest out there yeah and you know uh I, i've seen a lot of videos and i'm sure you guys have too if you're into permaculture and these swales uh you know people show the outside of the swales as, as basically being like a, a barren desert with nothing growing we did not find that to be the case at all there's choya growing there's Pillow Verde's growing. There's barrel cactuses. Actually, there's from, swaros. It is pretty green. Yeah, there's actually, I was going to say there's more diversity of life out there than is in here. I would have to agree with that, too. I mean, all I've seen in here is mesquites, and there's some desert plants and grasses, and some introduced Bermuda grass, which can just take over and be a weed in and of itself. It doesn't belong here. Yeah. You know, we were kind of disappointed too. You know, we were walking around just uh, shooting some B-roll and, and trying to get the lay of the land. And, uh, you know, we were looking down at the ground and we seen, uh, you know, for instance, uh, Jeff Lawton's video. You know, he walked in and it looked like, uh, like a lush tropical rainforest almost, you know, uh, waist high grass or taller. And, you know, he dug down in between the grass and... I mean, it looked like there was about a foot of like worm castings and mulch and we haven't found that to be the case. No. You know, the, the ground, the soil structure is excellent. You know, it's, it's not rock hard clay. It's more of an aggregate clumped together. Very, very easy to dig through. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, organic matter mixed in there that we just can't see, but it's bone dry. Like I said, we dug down a foot and I'm going to show you guys. All right, guys, so uh, George printed out some questions, all right? We're going to do a little question and answer here. Uh, it pertains to permaculture and, you know, what plants would be good for it and how what they've done here could be applied to your yard. So go ahead, George. Let's fire these off. Yeah, so I just, I know you help, you're helping me build a food forest in my backyard, and that's one of the goals of your channel is to help your viewers help them build food forests of their own. So... My question, what functions are we seeing here that you would consider being applied from a permaculture perspective or standpoint? Okay, so there's a couple angles to look at that question. You know, if you're in a, an urban setting like my yard, you know, I'm in an HOA. My yard's a little bit raised in elevation from the street or the drainage behind the house. Um, so as far as... Uh, you know, a swale like this that's collecting runoff from the mountains running down through the, the desert and then getting collected by the swale and sinking into the ground and, and holding moisture down deep in the soil for these larger trees. Um, you know, that, that aspect is not really going to pertain to you. But, you know, if you have a house on the property, every, every house is going to be a watershed. So it's very, very possible that, you know, if, if you have... Uh, a roof that's pitched in a certain direction, you could try to divert that water instead of running off your property to irrigating your plants. You know, I understand if you're in an HOA, you're not going to put a gutter on your house because they're probably not going to allow that. But, you know, you could watch when it rains and see which way that rain is, is flowing off your roof and try to yeah. divert it back into your property to save you water. Uh, you know, you're going to be using rainwater at that point, so you're not using... Uh, treated water from the city, it's going to be cheaper and your plants are going to like it more. So as far as swales go, you know, if you have a, a larger property, you know, you could do swales on contour, you could do a checkerboard pattern of swales. Um, and, you know, if your yard has a slight slope to it, you're going to do the swales. If it's flat, you're going to do the checkerboard pattern just to hold that rainwater in. 
You know, a lot of people look at this rainwater coming down. You know, we get these monsoon storms with torrential downpours and people are scared of it. It's because they don't have their yard set up properly with mulch that's going to absorb the water and sink it in and help their plants grow. Their most of their yards, you know, are are not friendly to the rain. They're they're covered in crushed rock or concrete and you know, it's it's one thing that people really need to get away from is the thinking of, you know, everyone else does this. I just moved to Arizona, let's say, and, you know, I got to copy them because this is how everyone does it. They must know better than me, but they don't, yep. you know. All so, right, guys, I apologize for the change of scenery, but the camera was getting way too hot in the sun. So <laughs> we're on the other side of the swale here in the uh, the mesquite grove, I guess you'd call it. So uh, go ahead, George, and fire off your uh, your other question. All right, so um, what we're seeing here, like how can this be applied to the viewer's yard? You were talking about doing yeah. little swales in the backyard. You were talking about the swales being on contour. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, on contour, I know a lot of people hear that term and they're like, what the hell does that mean? So on contour, um, basically, if you look at like a topographical map, it shows you the elevation of the land and, and how it changes. And on contour is going to be basically for people that know about topographical maps, it's going to be on the same exact line of elevation. Or, you know, if you're looking at a hill and uh, you're basically just trying to stay at the exact same elevation on that hill or land or whatever it is, you don't want your swale one side to be this low and one side to be up here on the land. You know, you want to bring it around so it's all level on the top so if you took a laser beam and shot it across the top of the swale that would be nice and level and the, the land at the base would be nice and level and that helps to keep the water trapped right there at that spot exactly sink in yeah because yeah. if it's if it's not on contour all that water is going to hit that swale and just run off the lowest end yep so you know like i was saying uh as far as swales go it's mainly water harvesting you know, and you're just trying to slow the water down as it flows, you know, or where it sits and just sink it into the ground. So the water might not stay living in the desert like we are. It might not stay at the surface like it, it's doing here, which we're going to show you. But, you know, if you dug down five feet to where these these bigger trees with these bigger roots, they're going down into that moisture. So there's oh, always yeah. a pool of moisture for them. Yeah, and if you notice out here, I mean, you guys will see it in the footage, but all the trees are in the horseshoe shape. Like, none of them are actually out in the little circular paddy area here. So these trees are sending those roots down, I mean, if you're looking at it, at least 10 feet. Exactly. Yeah, to yeah. get all the water that's, see that's soaked right into these berms. Yeah, so these the the berm part of the swale, yeah, that's where the water is going to stop, and that's mainly where it's going to settle in. So, yeah, if you're uh, if you're into permaculture, you know, normally you're going to plant your trees on the berm. All right, so uh, does that answer most of your question? I hope. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Let's get the next one. So the next one really isn't a question, but it's more of a topic, and we are right now experiencing the importance of it. But that is shade. Yes. In the desert. Yep. And um, as I've been watching more permaculture videos, they say shade is more important than even the mulch that we find so important in our backyards. Yeah. Well, so, the shade brings the mulch too. Yeah. So without, without shade, you're, you're not going to have mulch. So yeah, when it comes to uh, mulch, you know, if, if you have a foot of mulch and it's sitting there baking in the sun, it's just going to dry out every day. Um, mulch is important. You do need it, but yeah, you need the shade. So, you know, in the permaculture video that I did with George previously, you know, we talked about uh, the different layers of a permaculture food forest. And one thing that uh, I tried to make very clear was the most important thing is to get your canopy trees in, right? Because they, they provide shade, they provide wind protection because we have drying winds in the desert and that could just suck the moisture out of your yard. And, you know, you could plant sacrificial trees, native trees, or non-native trees that are sacrificial. Uh, a lot of people plant like uh, legume type trees because they're nitrogen fixers. Um, I really don't think that aspect of it is going to be so important here, um, especially if you're going to put down like a, a chip drop or mulch, you're going to compost in place. 
you know, for the first year, if you, if you really wanted to, you could, you know, fertilize on top of the wood chips or underneath them uh, for the nitrogen source. But uh, shade is going to be the most important thing. So we're standing in a shady area right here and there is, there is mulch. There's not very much. We're, we're on a hill that's running down into the basin of the swale. So this would be the backside of the swale mound running down and you know a lot of the mulch is going to travel downhill a lot of the water is going to run off so you know what little water does fall here it's going to it's going to get absorbed into the mulch but the shade is going to help keep it from evaporating so that is a right. major major thing so if you're starting a food forest in your yard i would say yes 100 percent shade is going to be your number one um, mulch is going to be your number two they could uh, the mulch is going to be easier to accomplish right away right right unless you got unlimited funds and you can bring in all these trees which i don't recommend because buying nursery trees it's it's just never going to work out for you um if you're in a non-hoa mulberries are a great choice um figs are a great choice um a lot of hoas don't allow fruit trees and stuff you're not going to start a food forest in a uh a banned neighborhood like that anyway so think of that before you buy the, the house and the land but yeah you know, you got to get something that you can plant there, like a mulberry or a fig or something that's going to grow very big, very quick, provide you the shade, and then you can bring in the mulch. Yeah. So the one thing I've noticed pertaining to that topic is we moved here because the camera keeps overheating and you go underneath this shade and we're at least 10 degrees cooler oh, yeah. than outside. For sure. Even the wind feels cooler yeah. over here. You know, it's it's got to be like you said about a 10 degree difference and the wind just it makes it feel great and then you go out over there and yeah it's blazing hot and the, the wind even feels hot it's not cooling right? so yeah to a little tiny tree that's in mulch i mean at least its root base is constantly moist but the top of that tree is transpiring that moisture right through and evaporating it into the air so underneath the coolness of the shade, that transpiration rate is going to be a lot less. Exactly. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize too, you know, if you water a plant, that ground might be pretty moist, but if your plant's sitting out in the meadow over there, transpiring like crazy, the soil around those roots could dry out really quick. The soil around the plant might still be moist, but those roots are not sitting in moist soil. They're sitting in very dry soil and that could kill your plant very quick. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, too, you know, with the, the drying winds, you know, going through here, you know, you got a lot of trees pr transpiring and it's, it's kind of like a jungle, but, you know, even though the winds are blowing through, they're still, the winds are still picking up moisture. So it's probably, uh, I don't have a humidity gauge, but I would guess under these trees here, it's probably a good five, 10% higher uh, yeah. relative humidity than it would be out in the field. Yeah, when we dug into, we dug into soil several places, but around the base of these trees is where the moist, the more, more moisture content was. Yeah. I well, mean, yeah, there was actually some moisture. Some content. moisture content. Yeah, out in yeah. the field, it was just literally like digging in a bag of flour. Powder, yeah. Yeah. So. All right. So next question, George. All right. Uh, let's see what we got. Um, earthworks like this don't have to be this scale in order to be effective on the landscape do they no definitely not you know i mean obviously we're out here in the desert this is uh almost like an unlimited amount of of space you can do whatever you want you know if you have property like this you can get yourself an excavator get yourself a laser level and do some research and you can make some giant swales like this and and probably a, a pretty nice tropical paradise for for whatever you want to grow but, you know, in your yard, yeah, you know, like I was saying, if you have flat land, like let's say you have an acre of flat land, you know, it's it, there's no runoff. The water just sits there. You could make a checkerboard pattern of swales, little mounds, you know, you, you, you measure out however big you want. I think they recommend somewhere around 14 feet or 16 feet long and wide. And all you need is maybe a foot of mounded up soil. You know, you don't need 10 feet. And you can make them as big or as small as you want. Um, as far as uh, a horseshoe shaped swale, you know, that, that's uh, going to be if you have some major water running through your property, you know, maybe during our monsoon system or some, uh, our monsoon season or something along those lines. You know, if you have a, a wash running through your property, I mean, you got to be very careful. You got to check local 
and state laws on uh, water <laughs> harvesting and stuff like that because yeah. you don't want to you don't want to flood your property out, float your house away or your car or you know your wind neighbors. up like yeah yeah wind up like the lost Dutchman you know getting pneumonia and dying yeah you know with with a pot of gold under your bed so um, you know the the swales like this they're they're more for if you have a lot more room you know usually in your backyard like I said if, before if you're doing rainwater harvesting from uh, the watershed coming off the roof of your house. You know, you could watch how the water flows and you could try to slow it down with, with mini swales. You know, they, they only have to be maybe six inches tall, a foot wide. And all you're trying to do is slow that water down so you yeah. don't get erosion. Because if the water's moving fast, it's going to wash your topsoil away. It's going to wind up pooling up somewhere. That's not what you want. You want a bunch of little pools all the way down the water path. And you want to try to keep that as much as that water as you possibly can in your yard but you also have to plan for you know we get the hundred year flood or the hundred year storm so you got to keep that in mind you know you gotta i would say uh, your best bet would be to start a log you know of the weather um your watering schedule how much rain we had when it came how long it lasted you know maybe uh write down you know hey in this part of my yard i had a ton of water pooling up and the water came from here so i'm going to try to divert it to other parts of the yard that didn't get as much water okay that was a mouthful yeah that was <laughs> i know <laughs> a little bit of the, regurgitation from my head uh, all right let's go what's the next one George? oh the next one just um so i mean we're we're looking at pretty much mesquite yeah, that's all I see around here. Yeah, there, a lot of yeah. mesquite. There's some Palo Verde. There's this one right here behind us is is a Palo Verde. Okay, a giant one. And, so, uh, what plants do we have in our arsenal to fulfill all the functions of these food forests? Well, like I said, you know, uh, figs, mulberries. Um, mulberries are an extremely underrated tree. Um, different varieties of mulberries also produce fruit um, at different times. And same thing with figs. They don't all produce at the same time. So, you know, if you can grow a bunch of mulberries, um, you get a bunch of different varieties and you can plant those and you could have, you know, depending on the variety, different harvests throughout the spring, summer, and fall. And there's also methods too with uh, mulberries. You could actually strip the leaves off a branch and when it re buds and puts out new leaves on that branch, it'll actually put out more fruit. So you can have another harvest. I don't recommend doing that yeah. to the whole tree or, or, you know, nonstop. But, you know, if you really like mulberries and I haven't met anyone that doesn't like a mulberry, um, you know, that's definitely a way to get uh, more food to yourself or your family or your livestock or, you know, George and I, uh, we have bearded dragons. So, you know, they can eat the leaves. That's another oh, thing. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't know. You can make tea out of mulberry leaves. Um, I make it all year round. You know, when the tree has leaves, not so much in the winter when it drops them, but uh, I'll save them. You can freeze them. And uh, you just do about four decent sized leaves to four cups of water. You boil it for 10 minutes. You scoop the leaves out, let it cool off. And you got a super healthy tea. They say it's good for uh, diabetes and uh, glaucoma and uh all sorts of stuff like that you can google around and i'm sure you'll find all sorts of good information and some mis misinformation yeah. but it's out there um so yeah mulberries figs um but now with the mulberry though that serves multiple functions it right it grows super fast it grows super fast and it can become a shade tree shade food right. um you know also in, in times of need you know you could propagate it and you could sell it online or you could sell it locally and you can make money that way too for your your, yeah. your family or just yourself or, or whatever you know if you're going to give it away to charity or church you know it's really up to you um but yeah they they are excellent shade trees you don't have to plant any you know nothing but mulberries um it is a very cheap readily available option especially in the you know the valley um but, you know, there's a lot of other trees. One thing you have to really be mindful, though, with trees is you need to look up uh, their ultimate size. You know, you got to be mindful if you're planting a tree close to a cement structure, such as a block wall or a house. Right. You know, you got to make sure you're not going to lift that wall. You're not going to crack your foundation. If you have a septic tank, you got to make sure you're not planting it, 
in uh, too close a proximity to your septic tank because that could actually grow through the little holes in your leach field and back you up and then you got a headache on your hands um but another thing to consider too is you know we get very high winds you know we get hurricane force winds so uh, mulberries, I haven't had any problem with them breaking. Um, sometimes when you first start them out, they grow so fast, they get a little top heavy and you might have to stake them. But you know, there's certain trees that do grow fast. Like let's say a, a polonia, all right. They're a uh, Royal Empress polonia. They, they're not native here. Uh, they're kind of an invasive species. They're not illegal. You can grow them. Um, but a tree like that, they get very big, very quick. They are tropical looking. Um, they don't produce fruit. The leaves aren't edible or anything like that that I know of, but they are prone to branches breaking off. So that's another thing you really need to do your research on what kind of trees you're going to plant because in our high winds, you know, if you have a eight, 900 pound limb and it's hanging over into your neighbor's property and that gets blown off, that could be a major, major headache and a lot of money for you, or, you know, it could damage your yard or kill someone. So that's another thing to, to keep in mind but also you know you could even plant native trees you know you could walk around uh common areas maybe in your neighborhood and bring a little shovel uh you know after we get some rains and the ground is soft you could dig up you know pale verde seeds mesquite oh. seeds you know whatever palm trees eucalyptus everywhere yeah and you you know they're pretty fast growing desert natives to here um you can grow those and you know that'll get your your shade up and you can grow other more sun sensitive plants under it like let's say mangoes or avocados that are going to get massive and they will be able to take the sun when they are more mature but they need a parent tree to grow underneath and now those palo verdes mesquites eucalyptus and what have you that were natives that you grew those are sacrificial trees so you could chop those down and you can get your self a, a chipper shredder run it through that now you got free mulch so you, you could plant these trees. They don't have to be permanent. You know, they're, they're trees you got for free. They're maybe what you consider a garbage tree or whatever. And, you know, you just grow them until they serve their purpose. Their life is, is over. You chop them down and free mulch. And Moringa falls into that category, right? Moringa does, kind yes. Kind of like sacrificial. Yeah. Moringa, you know, a lot of people grow Moringa here. It's a great tree. It, it produces drumsticks that are edible. The flowers are edible. Um... The Everything's leaves are edible. edible. Yeah, the, the roots are edible, the bark supposedly. Um, but one thing you have to keep in mind with Moringa is they are one of those trees that do have very weak branches and they can snap in the wind. Um, they're also a tree that doesn't produce a lot of shade. It's more of a dappled light. So, okay. you know, if you're growing plants that need a little bit more light, Moringa would be a great choice as opposed to like a mulberry that's going to give you absolute complete shade. Okay. So with that being said, what, now this is really a question. I don't really know the answer. Are there different things you would want to plant underneath a mulberry as opposed to a Moringa? Yeah. So a Moringa is going to have a more open canopy, more open structure. It's going to let a lot more light through. Um, and versus a, a mulberry or a fig that has giant leaves and it's going to let almost no light through. So they are deciduous mm -hmm. uh, mold, uh moringa really aren't so moringa is going to pretty much hold on to its leaves unless you get a heavy frost they're going to hold on to their leaves all winter um so they're going to give you that dappled light throughout the year um so you gotta you gotta think of what you're going to plant underneath it you know let's say you want to grow an avocado um i would grow something that's going to give complete shade in the summer you know i uh I just did a video on how to grow an avocado and I use, um, for my smaller avocado tree, I just grow sweet potatoes over the top, uh, basically like over a, a chicken wire arch. Um, and then I also have some growing under a Pakistani mulberry because in the summer they need full shade. Okay. You know, they could take, they just, the ambient light is more than enough for them. Any more than that is going to kill them. Even, you know, an hour of morning sun is, is probably going to cook them when we're you know, a hundred plus degrees in the morning. Um, same thing with bananas. Um, if you plant a banana plant, I know everyone loves planting those. Um, the first year, full, full shade in the summer. They do not like sun in the summer whatsoever. You got to give them at least a year to get established with full shade. So okay. you probably wouldn't want to plant one of those under a Moringa, but then you got to keep in mind once that banana gets, you know, 15 feet tall, 
you're going to have to trim your mulberry to allow it to grow. Otherwise, those branches are going to knock into it, break the leaves off, and kill your banana. To let the sun actually hit that banana. Yeah. But you can actually just prune the mulberry to... Yeah. You just can air to, layer, just you to can allow do cuttings, that. or you can just yeah. do a chop and drop. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, um, what's the next question? Uh, the last question I have is like, what plants do you have at your place that fulfill these functions that you sell to the public? Okay. So, you know, with the food forest, you got your canopy trees. They're going to provide shade, wind protection. Um, then you got your, your understory plants. You know, those are uh, things like avocados that are going to be sun sensitive when they're young. Um, they usually grow, you know, in rainforests and stuff like that, in a more sheltered area like we're standing right now. And, uh, you know, then you got your, uh, your shrubs and then your vining plants, like let's say for instance, grapes would be a vine. Um, then you got your ground cover, which would be stuff like longevity spinach, which also needs full shade in the summer. So that would be a great choice under something like a mulberry. Um, but you still have to leave room for being able to harvest trim and, yeah. and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, and then you got your root crop. So, you know, sweet potatoes, I don't sell anything like that just because it's kind of pointless. You know, I just yeah. point people in the right direction. Hey, go to Walmart and get a bag of sweet potatoes for two bucks, throw them in the ground and you get to go. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I sell a lot of figs. I sell a lot of mulberries. Um, I sell avocados. Like I just gave you an avocado plant. Yeah. Uh, George picked up the bill for the gas coming down here. So he got a free avocado <laughs> <laughs> out of the deal. Um, I sell moringas, you know, a lot of times I'll, uh, I usually give moringa trees away. Um, I'll give seeds away cause I just have so many of them. I just don't have the room to grow them and they're so cheap. It makes people feel good, yeah. you know? So give some moringa seeds away, tell people, Hey, this is how you grow them, plant them. You want to grow them, go for it. Um, loofah seeds. I give a lot of loofah seeds away. Loofahs are great plants. They take full sun here. Don't need any sort of special fertilizer, just water. And they get massive. They provide a lot of shade. And uh, loofahs are actually edible when they're small. I've never eaten one, but supposedly they are. They're a gourd. When they look like a little uh, baby pickle, you could eat them. Um, <laughs> but you could also grow them for the seeds. You could uh, give them away during Christmas time for gifts. You know, hey, I grew a loofah in my backyard. Here you go. Wrap it up nice and pretty. Your, your friends and family will be blown away. Everyone thinks it's a sponge, but it's not. Um, as far as shrubs go, you know, you can grow mulberry trees and keep them as shrubs. Oh, as far as shrubs go, guys, you could grow like a, a Barbados cherry. Um, you can grow like a dwarf tree yeah. or something like that. That's going to be more of uh, your shrub type trees. Um, so those are going to be your understory. Your, I mean, your, sorry. That's going to be your canopy, your understory, and then your shrub. And, you know, your shrubs are going to kind of be in between your understories and your ground cover. Okay. So, so it sounds like you got it all covered. I do. Yeah. You yeah. know, my, my stock fluctuates from, from season to season, month to month, week to week. And I'm always trying to get different stuff in. Um, you know, if people have requests, I try to, to grow things, but most of the stuff I grow and sell is propagated off my own stuff. I know it's going to grow here. I know it's rooted out. I know it's ready to go and it's not going to die on you. Um, I give everyone my free plant care guide. Um, it tells you how to grow any sort of plant, tropicals, natives, whatever. It's all the same formula. There's nothing special to it. And, uh, you know, I always just, I try to talk to customers and, and just make sure that I understand what they're looking for in whatever plant they want. And, you know, if it's not a good fit, I'll tell them straight up, Hey, you know, I think this would be a better fit or, you know, it's a good fit and I'm not going to deny them a plant, but it, you know, if they're making a poor choice, I'll, I'll try to explain to them, but if they want it, I'll still sell it to them. Not a problem. So I think now, uh, we've talked enough. I think we're going to get out there into the field and, you know, maybe we'll dig a test hole up here in the shade and uh, then we'll Definitely. dig a test hole down out in the field and, and you can see the, the difference in soil composition. You know, like George was saying, uh, and I was saying before we were, uh, we thought we were going to be walking into some sort of tropical paradise with, you know, waist high grass or shoulder height grass and, and all this wildlife and stuff. And it really hasn't been the case. You know, if you're, uh, if you've ever been to the salt river, you know, North of Mesa, this pretty much reminds me of that. You know, it's, it's very, very similar, you know, and over there you got, uh, 
all the runoff running off into the mount from the mountains into the, sh the salt river and you know there might be some natural swales or dams from trees that fell over or cactuses or whatever and and it kind of created the same situation that's going on here so let's uh dig some test holes show you what it looks like hopefully we don't damage any roots in these trees and then we'll uh shoot some infrared from uh, in the shade to out in the meadow all right folks so the importance of shade here here we are this this soil has been in the sunlight and we're at 122 degrees and i just pan it over here to where this branch is shading the ground and it becomes 92 degrees all right now we dig the hole so that's completely different from my soil the, the shovel wouldn't even go in an inch <laughs> but here we go it's just like powder all right so we are a foot into this and like we were saying this this soil is like powder but you can see that it's the breakdown of a lot of organic matter um, if you were to do this in the the phoenix valley at least in my backyard in gold canyon you couldn't even get an inch into the soil it would be so compact and and so much clay um i dug this hole effortlessly in less than a minute so you could actually see all the organics down in there in the hole too i i you know some of it might have rolled in from when you were digging oh but, yeah i like this stuff yeah but a lot of it actually has organic material even i mean you're probably 10 inches down yep. and and there's organic material and you can actually see a lot of the plant roots sticking out of the sides of the hole too mm -hmm. so you know these little uh fine hair feeder roots they're they're looking for food in the topsoil right yeah they've got plenty of it yeah so you know we dug down about 10 inches here and i don't think we're going to dig down anymore i don't think it's really necessary um you know we might start damaging the the roots and the, the the soil life down below so we're just going to leave it at that we're going to backfill our hole and uh we're going to go out to the meadow meadow and we're going to dig another test hole and, and show you you know the difference from one hole to the other so here we are in the middle of the field and i mean the dead middle and we're looking at a patch of soil here or what i would call dirt but Let's see if we can find a steady temperature. God, we're looking 147, 155. So that's with no shade. So that's the big time importance of shade. Let's see, right off to the side of us is some plant material. We'll move this back. And we're getting a temperature of 129, 130. So just a little bit of plant material on the top of the soil drops the temperature 20 degrees. All right. Holy crap. I think we're on a root. Hmm. There's something under here. All right. Holy crap a little bit more towards you is that man made tire it's because I, I hit it and it was shaking my foot <laughs> all right let's move over here <laughs> yeah it's another tire probably the rest of the car is down there all right all right so hole number two in the middle of the field Still powdery, still full of organic matter, but you run into this right here. And this is where the, the water is settling in the field and it's being baked off very fast and it's creating this layer and it's very hard. 
crumbles under some pressure and it made this hole more difficult to dig. You have any input on what's going on there, Kurt? I think you hit the nail on the head. I think, uh, you know, it's uh, hitting that layer of soil and uh, it's packing it really tight and it's making it impermeable to water at that point. So every time it rains, I think it's just sitting at that layer and not going any deeper. And uh, again, you know, we have absolutely no moisture down there. So oh, yeah, absolutely none. There's a lot more rocks down here too. This is a little bit higher up from, from where the water does come into the swale. So, you know, if I had to guess, I'd say uh, just the fact that there's no trees here, no shade, I think you hit the nail on the head with that one. So, you know, as George keeps uh, reiterating that shade is definitely more important than the mulch. And I, I have to a hundred percent agree with him on that. Yeah, would you say if they had actually come back in here and planted this with trees and, and been thoughtful on the species of trees that they planted in here, they, they truly could have created an oasis in the desert? I think so, yeah. You know, and uh, the fact that this, this swale, you know, they put the mounds in, but I don't think they actually leveled out the ground behind the swale. You know, they could have put a bunch of little mini swales in to help slow the water down as it's coming in. Because this swale is pretty long. It, I mean, from the, where the water's coming in to the uh, the end of the the swale area where the mound is to trap the water, it's got to be at least you know the length of a football field, I would guess. Yeah. You know, I think if they uh, they diverted the water and maybe put mini swales in, um, you know, little horseshoe shaped mini swales all throughout with spillways, so it could fill up each individual little swale. I think they would have had a lot better luck. But you know, as we were saying, they they completed the mounds and they just abandoned them, you know? And it's been, uh, what, 85, 90 years by now. And, you know, it, it's still doing a great job out here, but, um, you know, if I think if they worked the earth a little bit more, I think they could have uh, actually gotten better results. Yeah, but yeah, they just did a little bit more tweaking the amount of food that could come out of just this, you know, little piece of property. Yeah, yeah, without, uh, with very little with, to uh, no outside water being brought in, just what yeah. runs off the land. Yeah, zero, almost zero irrigation. Yeah. If they, if they chose the right plants and the right mm -hmm. trees, zero irrigation, just yeah. what nature feeds it. And, you know, they could have also done a, uh, a dam, maybe a little bit right. up further, so they had a source of water, you know, that they could have used uh, gravity to feed into the swale area that we're standing in to help irrigate it yeah. in the dry season. They could have stored water. Yeah, um, definitely as Kurt and I walked around here, the, uh, we could find the wash where the water actually came in, but then it just kind of forms a ring around the basin of this swale. And, and where we're at right here is like you said, we're in the middle and it's just a little bit higher. So, there's no way for that water to really get out to this area. It just kind of forms a ring around the whole place. A lot of dead trees. All right, we're back in Mesa. It's been a couple of weeks. I've been trying to get this video edited, but, and it's taken me some time. I got other things going on with the plant nursery and life and stuff. So, uh, finally getting around to it. We drove down there, like I said before, it was like, over two hours to get there then we had a hike in we spent probably four or five hours there filming in the heat and no shade uh had a lot of issues with the camera overheating and uh you know i should have shot a lot more b-roll to show you guys around a little bit more i apologize for that um but you know george and i were both a little disappointed we got down there and we thought it was going to be you know this tropical paradise we get there and it's it looks like uh you know just dead barren land for the most part you know the soil composition was amazing um, a lot of the larger trees looked like they were uh, either dead or dying um, some of them were still alive and uh, you know we were walking around and uh, George said hey I want to hike up a little bit and uh, see where the water comes in check it out so we hiked up there and that's where we found what actually happened so there is a spillway coming in from the mountains right and it feed, feeds this major the main swale i guess you call it and uh probably about 
maybe 40 yards out from uh, the field where the water comes in, one of the sides ruptured. And it looks like it ruptured quite a, a long time ago, a few years probably. And instead of the water coming into the swale, it's spilling down over this, the side of uh, the path of the water and running down and around the swale. So as you can see in the video here, I'm gonna point out, um, it's just running down. And if you followed it all the way down, if you go to you know, your maps application on your phone or Google Maps or something like that, you could actually see the satellite image. It's running down, it's bypassing pretty much all the swales. It's cut a channel probably about two to three feet deep in some places through the desert and it runs down and onto the road that we parked on to walk into the swales. So I, uh, I was pretty upset about it. George was pretty upset about it. You know, something really needs to be done. I don't have the time and neither does George to get down there to repair this rupture that uh, fills the swale with water. So I contacted uh, Jeff Lawton and I figured, you know, he's got a huge audience, way bigger than me, right? Huge following and everything. And I'm sure he has people down in the Tucson area that uh, either watch his videos uh, or go on his forum or have taken his classes or in contact with him some way, shape or form. Uh, I was hoping he can get the word out that, hey, this swale uh, needs help, you know? Uh, the plants are dying. I'm sure the wildlife is long gone and it's going to take a few people to repair this thing. You know, it's, uh, it, I mean, it drops down. It's kind of hard to see in the video, but it does drop down probably a good, like five or six feet and then, uh, runs through the desert and out to the road. So, uh, you know, it, it's probably going to take some, uh, moving of, uh, pretty big rocks, you know, probably a hundred pound rocks. Um, to shore up that side and then fill it in with, with some dirt so it doesn't happen again um, and, and try to divert the water around that area. So, you know, it's going to take a couple of guys, uh, quite a bit of water to, to keep these people hydrated, um, probably quite a few shovels and probably a few wheelbarrows. So um, if anyone's watching this video and, you know, you're interested in permaculture, you're interested in the swales, you want to go do a good deed and you live down in the area or if you don't i mean if, if you're that awesome that you could actually take time out of your life to drive down there and fix these things man that would be greatly appreciated you know uh if i can't get anyone to do it um that's local or willing to go down there that has the time and the money and, and the resources to do it uh you know i spoke with george and, and we're probably going to make it down there maybe uh december or something you know, it, if all else fails and we're going to try to go down there and, and fix it ourselves, you know, when the weather's cool. And uh, so that's basically it. You know, uh, at one time, you know, if you watch other people's videos, Jeff Lawton has a really good one on it. You know, at one time it was an oasis in the desert, you know, waist high or taller grass, beautiful trees. I'm sure there were tons of all sorts of reptiles, birds you know, walking around in there, probably deer, javelina, maybe bear, mountain lion, who knows? I mean, it was probably great, but it's, it's, it's a need of repair. So hopefully it's not too far gone. You know, if we can get that water going back in there, you know, hopefully uh, someone watches this video, they can get down there before the monsoon season starts. You know, it's uh, May of 2023 right now. I think it's May 20th. Um, you know, our monsoon season, down at well i should say tucson's monsoon season starts a little bit earlier than phoenix and it is a little bit wetter so you know if someone can get down there in the next month and and try to repair it you know or even halfway through the monsoon season i'm sure anything would help but uh that would be greatly appreciated if anyone has any questions on exactly where it is um you could leave them down in the comments i'll get you my contact information you know we could either email text or, or phone call and uh, I could show you exactly where it is. You know, I'm gonna show it in this video, um, but I could describe better and uh, describe uh, what may be needed if someone's willing to do that. So in the future, guys, I'm gonna try to do more of these permaculture videos because I really am into it. Um, you know, I'm into the plant nursery thing and uh, 
I'm trying to get some money saved up so I can buy some property and buy land here in Mesa because uh, my yard is pretty small, you know? I think it's uh, an eighth of an acre and uh, I'm, I'm out of room. So, you know, whatever plant money I make, I'm uh, saving up and I'm gonna put that towards some land to get a, uh, a nursery going. And, uh, you know, with the plant nursery, I plan on doing like a free petting zoo, um, you know, you pick it type things, maybe have a, uh, a farmer's market going, um, you know, maybe pumpkin picking, stuff like that, seasonal type stuff, Oktoberfests, uh, Christmas, Easter, all that sort of stuff, you know, uh, hoping to do a, like a little conference center kind of thing. Uh, my daughter's into Kung Fu and she, she'd really like to teach people how to do uh, Kung Fu. So maybe a little spot like that for yoga, Tai Chi, Kung Fu. Um, so that's kind of my plans. I'm not going to get too crazy into it. You know, if you guys really want to hear about that, I can do a whole video on it and I can ramble on for hours. Uh, you know, I got the whole business plan going and everything. So, uh, you know, and if, Hey, if, uh, you're in the Mesa area and you got some property for sale or whatever, let me know, uh, you know, might be interested in it. So I'm going to try, uh, you know, I did the permaculture video at George's house and, uh, you know, he's, he's had a lot on his plate too with, uh, life and getting his yard going. So it's blazing hot right now. I'm probably not going to do an update, uh, for another month or two. I'm going to try to get out to his house and, and show you what he's done. He's got, uh, you know, chip drop and everything. And, uh, it's got a lot of plants in the ground, but uh, I'm definitely going to go out there in the fall and, uh, show you guys, uh, you know, the difference from before and after with some shots and everything. We'll do some before and after shots in the video and, uh, give you a little yard tour of what's going on there. Again, he's in gold Canyon, so he's butt up against the superstition mountains and he gets a lot more rain than, uh, than I do. Some years I don't get any measurable rainfall at my house, zero, believe it or not. Um, and it's, it's very hot here. I'm right next to a major freeway uh low-lying areas so the summers it gets hot the good thing is i don't get the the frost like everyone else does usually um last year i had i had uh some of the worst frost ever but uh you know where george is is a little bit different you know he's he's got cooler nights more rainfall cooler winters so uh you know we're gonna get a little bit more into the permaculture thing and uh if i can get this channel monetized soon uh, i'm definitely gonna start doing a lot more traveling um, going to different locations, talking about different plants, different uh, styles of growing and uh, maybe different plant nurseries and stuff like that. Just to show you guys, uh, you know, a little more content, try to get some more higher quality videos. I'm just really pressed for time right now with life and uh, the plant nursery and, and uh, the YouTube channel is killing me. Takes up uh, at least a day or two of my time every week. So, you know, I'd really appreciate it, guys, if uh, you could share hit the bell comment definitely the thumbs up is going to help bump my videos up try to get me monetized a little quicker you know tell your friends uh if you guys want to come down and see the plant nursery you know see what i have for sale uh i'm on craigslist and offer up just look for edibles and exotics um i have a lot of plants for sale that i don't have listed because i just haven't gotten the time to do it so um if you're interested in something let me know i got a lot of plants uh Need to get rid of a lot of plants so I can uh, get some smaller, more affordable plants in because a lot of my plants are left over from last year and they're they're big and they're going for uh, quite a bit more money than a smaller plant would. So uh, anyway, guys, that's basically it. You know, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, hit the bell. And until the next video, guys, keep growing. Oh, so guys, yeah, one more thing I wanted to clarify, you know, uh, when we were doing the questions and answer section, me and George, you know, in the video, uh, he was asking me, you know, like what plants I have that I sell that would fit, you know, certain category categories of the uh, permaculture design. So, you know, we got our canopy trees, we got our understory trees, we got our shrubs, bushes, our vines, our ground cover, and then root crops. So, you know, I don't really have that much room in my yard to, to grow everything I'd like to grow. So I mainly focus on, like my name implies, edible and exotic plants, you know. Um, it kind of all depends on where you are. You know, I'm more of a boutique kind of plant nursery at this point. Um, I don't buy 
plants from other people. I don't wholesale plants. Um, you know, it, pretty much everything I grow is either from seed or cuttings or air layers. Um, once in a while I do buy, you know, like banana plant tissue cultures because bananas are pretty big and a lot of people like them. But you know, what I have in my yard that I grow for myself is usually what I sell. Um, I try to diversify. I try, like I said, I'm not into, um, grafting to change varieties. I am into grafting to add varieties, you know, big difference there, chopping a tree off and, and growing a completely different variety out of that trunk versus grafting on little bits and pieces here and there to give you more variety. Um, so, you know, when it comes to like, let's say figs, you know, I think I got like 13 or 14 different varieties and I'm out of space. So if I want to add varieties, I have to graft onto my existing trees to grow a new branch with a different variety that I can propagate off of. Um, same thing with mulberries. Um, I think I got like 10 different varieties and uh, I'm pretty much out of room for uh, any sort of big trees like that. So, you know, growing them uh, orchard style, like you saw with the, uh, if you watch my, my fig tree trimming video, um, you know, I plarted that sucker down to four trunks, like three or four feet tall. The thing is enormous right now. I mean, it, it branched out like you wouldn't believe. Um, and, you know, we're what, two months into the spring already. So, you know, by the end of the spring, uh, it should be good. Next year, I may trim it again and do more cuttings, but I still got a billion and one cuttings to, to pot up. I haven't even had time to do that. Um, so kind of is what it is, but you know, if, if you want, um, you know, canopy trees, it, it really does depend where you are. Um, mulberries are great. Um, the only problem with growing mulberries that big is, uh, your birds are going to get to them before you are, uh, maybe, uh, a nuisance kind of tree at that point. So, you know, if you're looking to, check all the uh, notches on the permaculture design when it comes to plant selection, um, you're really going to have to, you know, either call me up and I can come out and look at it for you, or you're really going to have to do some research. You can message me down in the comments. If you have any questions, you want to bounce off at me, uh, off of me, and I can give you some answers um, to, to help you out. Um, I usually don't charge for any sort of consultation like that. If it's a really far drive, I just can't do it because I don't have the time. Um, a lot of times if I do a consultation, I'll say, Hey, it's free, but you gotta let me film. So if you guys are into that. That's cool too. Um, I get a lot of customers asking that. So, you know, I'm totally down with that. That'd be fine. But, uh, you know, mainly, uh, in Arizona, you know, we got the high winds and stuff in the Valley here. So you gotta be very careful with your canopy trees. Um, you know, a lot of times, like I said before, you can grow sacrificial trees, native trees, and then chop and drop them. Um, but as far as uh, fruiting trees, which is mainly what I sell, you know, unless you want to grow them sky high and let the birds get most of the fruit, you know, you might be better off uh, not growing a giant canopy, but maybe a, a, a 20, 30 foot tall canopy instead of a, you know, 50, 80 foot tall canopy. If you have the room, you can do the 50, 80 foot tall, but a smaller yard, you know, you're going to want to keep them kind of small. Um, you know, as far as, uh, shrubs and bushes, man, I got a lot of those. We got figs, mulberries, you know, uh, I got bananas, uh, chaya, uh, a lot of stuff like that. Um, I got Queensland bottle trees, which are an exotic. They don't get that big. Um, they're kind of small right now, but I do have those for sale. Um, I got a million of those actually. They do great in this, uh, climate. If you look them up, you know, they're native to Queensland, which, uh, gets colder in the, the winter, hotter in the summer. And, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty much adapted to here. They can take full sun and everything. Um, as far as, uh, ground cover, you know, I got the longevity spinach. I got tree collards. Um, what else? I got, uh, sugar canes. Uh, pineapples, you know, it, it kind of just really depends on uh, the time of the year and what I have in stock. But, you know, if you're looking for some permaculture stuff, hit me up and let me know and uh, I'll let you know what I got. You know, if, if I don't have it, then uh, I could probably point you in the right direction or give you uh, some pointers on where to find it for the best price.